Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Preservation Migration Seminar 2022. This uh, um, just introduced uh, the seminar, uh, which is uh, organized by the Preservation Migration Commission of the Fiat IFTA, uh, which uh, I chair. And uh, together with me in the, in the background, uh, we have uh, Etienne Marchand, the, the co-chair, and uh, Sebastian Martin, the network and communication coordinator of Fiatifta. Uh, and just uh, a few information about uh, how the, the seminar is organized. The authors, the, the speakers and the panelists are uh, uh, shown in the slides. And, they are members of the Preservation Migration Commission. Uh, unfortunately, today we don't have Denise Barcella of RTS, uh, who could be um, today in the meeting. However, she contributed to the preparation, the organization of the seminar, and uh, we keep we keep her name in the author list. Um, so, how it is organized? We will have some interactivity with the audience. Um, this is done with uh, uh, some polls. We will have three polls. Uh, the first will be about film collections, about your film collections, which probably are, are the reason for why you are attending this webinar. Then we have uh, Richard Wright, the preservation guide, uh, setting the scene of the film in television archive. We'll follow with uh, a second uh, poll. Each poll uh, has a few questions uh, regarding digitization. Of course, it's digitization of film. And uh, then uh, the second speech is from Jörg Hubert from Tech. Uh, it's about knowing the collection. So. We'll say that uh, there are many interesting new technologies out that broadcasters can evaluate to see if they can help them. So you, you, you will see. Uh, then the last uh, polls about uh, formats, digital formats, or formats output as the output of the digitization. After which we will have uh, a number of speakers uh, involved together in, in uh, providing information in terms of uh, case studies, in, in terms of experience, uh, in terms of debates among, among, among themselves. So uh, Miroslav Juliat uh, from RTA, um, Denise Barcelles not there, Carol Savadini from uh, Signal Memoria, uh, RTVC, Peter Schellauer from the uh, Ioannium Research Institute, uh, Christoph Bauer from Österreich Rundfunk and uh, Kathleen Bertlin from uh, VRT. Um, it is a, uh, I, I ask you please to the, I ask the audience to write if they have any questions in the question and answer session so um, that we can review the questions together with the team and we will dedicate uh, about uh, 20 minutes uh, uh, to revising these questions and, uh, and uh, providing multiple answers is, is possible, if possible. The task uh, of uh, the conclusions are, um, is, is the task of conclusion is given to Charles Farrell of the British Film Institute. He, he has uh, some words ready, however, he, he will also take into account uh, uh, what happened uh, during, during this event. Um, that's it. Uh, it. It seems it's the time for launching the first uh, the first poll. So uh, I will try this interesting Zoom feature. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, first run. I don't uh, want to uh, to steal the time um, to 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 Richard. Please, Richard. Um, thank you, Laurent. Uh, so, setting the scene, uh, this is a slide that I used at a conference nearly 20 years ago, and it was a small conference in California, a lot of very bright people in the room. Sergey Krin was just sitting in a chair in one of the rows, he's the founder of Google. Um, Google wasn't 
quite as big uh, then as it is now. And somebody raised their hand and said, uh, well, Richard, you said you're from a television archive. You're from the BBC, but uh, those are film cams. Um, and you maybe don't have to be a founder of Google to realize that those are film cams. And, and indeed they are because in the BBC and in many TV archives, uh, a large part of the content of the, what's called the television archive is indeed film. Um, people have said, why are those cans standing on edge? They shouldn't be standing on edge. Um, and that was a decision that was taken for health and safety reasons. This was the working archive. Um, anywhere between 100 and, well, up to several hundred of these film cans would be moved off the shelves every day um, back in the 1990s. By the year 2000, the use of the archive had gone way down, but we kept them on their side so that you could pull them off the shelf without having to take a whole stack of films, which is very, very heavy. And, and so that's how they're standing on their side. Could we have the next slide, Laurent? What is all this stuff? Um, I put the 1930s in there because the BBC did start television in the 1930s. There were some other broadcasters experimenting, but certainly uh, right up until, well, it was... Uh, Sorry. Um, in the end of the 1990s, when production in the BBC made its last um, high level or high end production on, on film, um, and that was Pride and Prejudice. Uh, so that was one thing. People who wanted to make quality television wanted to shoot it on a quality medium. And film has always been Historically, right up until the last, say, 10 years, film has always been much better than television in quality. And that's a problem we'll come back to. It was also used for time shifting. If you wanted to, to um, have a replay of something in two weeks' time, or even if you wanted to have a replay on the West Coast of the USA for something that was being shown on the East Coast, you used film. Um, news gathering. When you sent a crew out to doorstep a politician or something like that, um, a videotape machine from the 60s was the size of a small car. Um, well, maybe not quite the size of a small car, half a small car. It was the price of a small car. And, and so a, a film camera, a 16 millimeter film camera was much, much smaller than videotape right up until the early 1980s when pneumatic so-called camcorders came out. Um, camcorders have not always been with us. For speed, it was a direct positive, meaning you didn't shoot a negative, print a negative, and then show the, the print. You used ectochrome. I think people under 40 may have never seen a slide, certainly not taken a slide, but we used to make slides and slides were ectochrome or some other um, manufacturer of direct positives. And then finally, uh, an issue that is prominent in television archives, because of the editing and because of maybe wanting to take the um, images and put a different soundtrack on them, it was very, very common in television that you had the soundtrack on a completely separate piece of film, uh, a piece of film that had no pictures on it. It just had iron filings on it. If you put iron filings all over a piece of acetate, that is an absolute in invitation for vinegar syndrome to develop. Um, so large collections with so-called SEP mag, separate magnetic soundtracks have been a major source of the vinegar syndrome. And the people who mostly have that problem have been the television archives. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Right. Um, I worked in the BBC, so that's where some of my knowledge comes from. But we did do a survey, and this again is 20 years ago. We did a survey of 10 European television archives. Um, so this included Bry, where Laurent is from, and it included Ina, and it included uh, where Christoph is from, ORF, and the Scandinavian archives, and the, the, the big Dutch archive built in Hlaud. And we found altogether just under 5 million hours of video, well, of, of 
television content, um, sorry, television and radio content, but above the, of the, of the television content, 1.6 million hours of videotapes and 1 million hours of film. So again, this 30%, 40% figure was general across all of those archives. Um, there are many problems with film. It's, it's not just one thing. Um, even in our questionnaire, we asked about 35 and 16 and color and black and white. Um, so this on, this on the slide, you can see a breakdown of some of the different kinds, um, including way down at the bottom, a, a special kind of thing that we don't get in video or even in photography that much, an intermediate, which is kind of a submaster. So we had all these various kinds of film and film related SEPMAG um, media in our archives. The reason we are here today is because much of this film is still sitting on shelves. Um, why hasn't it been digitized? That's, that's a long story, but again, going back 20 years, the Canadian company that was developing the first 4K chip to put in a Hollywood camera um, was at the big Rye technical exhibition in Amsterdam. And he asked a group of us what we were waiting for. What was the technical spec? We were waiting for data cine to replace telecine because converting film to video was always a downgrading at those days. Television has moved on, but what we were waiting for was at least 2K scanning of 16 millimeter and at least 4K scanning of 35 millimeter. And we didn't want the scanning to be tied to a 16 by nine television format, we wanted the scanning to be tied to the film format, the academy format, or whatever the actual film format was. We wanted the brightness to be much better than the brightness of television, the brightness range, um, going up to 14 f-stops, not just the 10 or even 8 that was usual in, in television. And it just wasn't happening. And when it was happening, it was happening at low resolution. What we're going to be hearing in the case studies that we should get to as soon as I finish is um, actually finding out what has been happening because there has been enormous, it's very, very surprising to me, enormous development in scanning equipment in the last 20 years. Um, up until 20 years ago, people who made scanning equipment, the most, what happened to most of them was that they went bust and the companies got taken over and taken over and taken over. Um, that still happens a bit, but we now have a wide range of scanning equipment and cost-effective equipment, um, high dynamic range equipment. And so the, the problem of the amount of material that's sitting on the shelves is in my view now solvable. Um, the question is cost and quality. And um, this seminar is really to try to promote people getting this film off their shelves and into use where we can exploit its value, release its value, un, um, unwrap its cultural value and historical value and, and make this content available. Um, so that's it for me and off to hear about how people do that. Thank you. So thank you so much. Uh, and now is the time of listening, Jörg Uppert. Please, uh, Jörg. Thank you, Laurent. So my speech is a motivation to activate work with your physical collection. So you will see. Uh, so you can conserve film, but if you want to preserve it, I think you have to understand and physic the physical condition and to have to see the mechanical and the photographical signs of aging. And yeah, I want to show this and why. And we had already the, uh, the vinegar syndrome. So next slide, slides, please. So yes. this is Paul with uh, vinegar syndrome. You have answered that. Uh, that most of you think you have it under control and that is perfectly. So for the one who not fully are aware, short intro. So film is typically uh, 
on the aesthetic side of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, material so it it starts with an hp6 and uh, not, not much happens until the way it gets even more aesthetic to five and when it goes very quick and as as soon as you have that auto catalytic point uh, it rapidly starts to degrade uh, and you will see a shrinking and a curling and warping of a film material so uh, i think uh, that is what what happens and uh, there is good uh, documentation available even on a very deep and chemical level look for mike newman's uh, documents or the ipi institute uh, there's really good good documentation freely available. Next slide, please. The traditional way to classify vinegar syndrome is the use of AD strips. The, this is dye-coated paper strips, uh, and you put it uh, in, in the can and, uh, and wait for a while. And a while depends on, on temperature and humidity. Uh, and then you get the color coding uh, out of the uh, of, uh, um, uh, a sick uh, in the atmosphere in the box. So um, how does that look? Next slide, please. How does that look direct in, uh, in a physical wheel? So I did uh, look on the right side. I did that uh, two or three days ago. I put a new strip the, in, in a can, uh, wait eight hours uh, and uh, get a yellow back. And yes, opening the can uh, was easy to, to know that, that that has the vinegar because I go outside because it smells so much. Um, the, the wheel you see is uh, no longer the flat. Uh, it is uh, warped and uh, uh, curling. Uh, and uh, yep, there is still equipment and can play that type of, uh, of media uh, and that was not available a few years ago and I think that is a good good thing to at least try to save as much as possible. Next slide please. There are recommendations, uh, a lot of recommendations in the area of, uh, of vinegar symptoms are available in the internet but uh, we are not really focused on television uh, material. But uh, the EBU has done uh, guidelines more than 20 years ago, uh, and they are still available online. Uh, and as Richard also already mentioned, the uh, magnetic uh, material should not be close to the uh, vinegar syndrome film. And uh, of course, uh, if you have a film that are affected, uh, they have to store separately, so I, try, I think that are the, the basics. Uh, interestingly, uh, 20 years ago, the, the recommendation was to store that uh, uh, ZEPMAX, that also uh, Richard already mentioned, the magnetic uh, sound tapes for the, again, on polyester material, so that it's not affected. Uh, but of course, I think that has changed over the last 20 years, no one is uh, recommending this any longer go to the digital file with uh, with that media as quick as you can. Next slide, please. But uh, vinegar symptom is not the only enemy uh, out there. Uh, Richard also mentioned the, the ectachrome material, so the reversal material used for news uh, at that time. Uh, I didn't have one in, in my collection, so I used uh, a standard Eastman uh, uh, cinemascope material, but uh, reddish is clearly to see. And uh, the question now is uh, how good can that be uh, captured so that the remaining uh, yellow and uh, cyan dye uh, can be recovered? And again, there are tools available uh, where you can play back and measure at the same time the remaining uh, level of, uh, of that uh, dye so that, uh, that you can have some support with uh, the decision uh, which film to select and uh, whether you are too close to get the color recovered in a good, good way. Next slide, please. So if you have only a, a few the tape splice, it's not a big deal. Uh, next slide. If you have a lot because you have a cutting cut reel, uh, then it's really 
uh, getting ugly. And uh, next slide, please. You should try to consider whether we really have to, to check that and uh, to digitize and to renew all this uh, tape supplies. And again, having the machines that help you to uh, run even that old, uh, uh, old uh, bad splices uh, without opening that uh, is, is a good uh, help to, to get a digital assess copy and an inspection report to, to know about uh, the, the content and make a decision uh, out of it. So next slide. So <clears throat> the good news, uh, podcast archives uh, have uh, if not all the material that is problematic, we have seen a few, but uh, of course, uh, nitrate is uh, typically not uh, with us uh, in, in, the, in the television archives. Uh, and we have other good news uh, that uh, the collections are more homogeneous when uh, in memory institutions, you don't get a donation and uh, don't know what material you get and which condition with, uh, with uh, what uh, history of storage. So I think it's, uh, it's not the baddest uh, thing to make automation and try to automate the work because you have good and homo homogeneous uh, uh, condition of most of the material. Next slide. So what we find very often is uh, that uh, podcasters has already started as, uh, as Richard mentioned with Telecine machines in the early days. So important material is already available in SD resolution uh, done with uh, the old sensor technology. So spirit or shadow machines are used at that time very much. And uh, only a few material is really done in full resolution uh, and scanned uh, uh, and restored and color graded. And that is also because it's an immense uh, work of preparation uh, to get that uh, done. Uh, and so a lot of uh, broadcaster, I think, in, uh, still have to do a lot of work. The question we had in the, in the bullet, uh, in the poll was not really about, do you have your film in full quality? The question was only, do you have it digitized? Here, the question is, do, how much of your film do you have in the full quality so that you may can uh, use that as an, as an alternative to the physical media? Uh, and uh, also uh, looking to the photochemical condition, uh, how often do you can do that uh, if you see how big the collections are, uh, you need uh, very efficient tools to do so. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Of course, uh, no time to, to, to go in deeper discussion how to do that, but uh, there are a recommendation. My recommendation is to read the recommendation for uh, digitization in a sustainable digitization workflow that is done uh, in, from the German Dean, the standardization body, and it is available document uh, in, in English language, and the links are here uh, for a preview. Uh, and uh, of course, the links will be, uh, be made available via the, the Fiat, uh, Fiat uh, net uh, page to click it directly so you don't have to worry with the long links on, on that. Next slide, please. So on, on the European side, uh, there's also a new uh, um, standard coming up in, in final draft, uh, that framework for digital preservation of cinematographic work uh, is more focused on the IT side of doing the, the job. So how to integrate metadata, how to deal with different uh, variants of the material uh, with the different wheels. And uh, all that is, uh, is now also standard on a European level and it's worth to have a look if you like IT. If you don't like IT, don't, don't have a look. It's really going deep in the IT side. Uh, and just uh, last week, we have the approval of the national bodies. So it's, uh, it's, the document will come and uh, it will come this year uh, and you can get access to it. Next slide, please. Next slide is already the last slide. Uh, so oh, I like sorry. one minute. <laughs> yeah, and I like to conclude here. Uh, so I think you should uh, look for new technology to help you uh, with, uh, with your process. Uh, and there is a lot of technology out uh, that can help you and that was not available 
10 years or 20 years ago. So one, one recommendation is check the quality of, uh, uh, of the scanner in use. Typically scanner are uh, like black boxes and you have not assessed really how they work internally, but you should know the technical condition and there are tools out uh, that do that more or less automatically using a special alignment film uh, and special automated software. It's a, it's a way to document also what the machine is doing because no scanner is a lossless process. Next uh, thing is generating QC events as early as possible. Uh, do it while scanning because then you have a possibility to have AD, uh, AB con comparison directly and a lot of discussion, un unnecessary discussion can be stopped if you uh, have critical things, uh, AB and see the film and see what the scanner has done out of that. But uh, the next point is, uh, is also don't understand QC as a single point in a workflow by doing your migration process. The, supervising the whole uh, process and integrating the whole process is really a big, big thing if you have a larger uh, collections to do and it's, it's really the, the solution for efficiency. So use data-driven approaches, uh, there are uh, things out that was not out for years ago uh, and, uh, and look for, for that and uh, study the new possibilities uh, out in the market. And of course, if you work with external partners for doing digitization, think more about the tender process and how you describe your technical requirements. I have seen so much uh, uh, tenders out in the last 20 years that has not been really good in that demand. Uh, I think you have, you need to do come to a level where you clearly can describe the, the, the technical requirements. And if you can't search for yeah, someone who is willing to help, uh, I think that's from my side. Uh, if you can't measure, you can't manage your process. That's, that's a message. Uh, so I think you are ready for the next poll. And uh, good afternoon from Dublin, from RTE. Uh, maybe good evening to somebody or good morning in Australia. It's uh, midnight now, I believe. So, um, so I will just expand a little bit on our own experiences, what Jörg uh, alluded to in terms of this immense work of preparation. By, by all means, it is, it is a lot of work and there are no shortcuts. It it um, has to be has to be done diligently and uh, to the great level of quality and detail, uh, and we found that film from different years uh, would is very likely to have different splicing techniques used, and and we found different experiences as well prepping that film for digitization. For example, preparing film before 1967, we find that that have um, cement splices which are still holding. Uh, and then trouble starts from 67 to 72, where um, tape splices would have uh, adhesives that would have dried out by now. So they every single one needs to be replaced, like it was well illustrated in one of York's images earlier. And then we would then splicing improves still tape, but adhesives have improved uh, from 1972, which was 50 years ago, but still not dry, still still usable and, and not all of them need to be replaced if some do. So, so that's a cheat sheet if you need some background info. There's a good chance that your uh, collection has similar splicing techniques over these uh, ages, but it'll be interesting if you have some comments of your own, if this is matching your experiences or is, if it's different. On the next slide, I'll just briefly talk about different approaches um, uh, in, to digitization, Lauren, if you could progress, please. Um, it's just that we we found we, we generally tend to divide vast majority of sixteen mil, like it's mentioned a few times earlier, and and uh, and we found that um, we we can uh, quickly turn around short form content in terms of prepping on demand or prepping as part of the project of a specific collection. And we found very suitable solution that works for us well for prepping and scanning in-house in high definition formats. And when I talk about short form content, I mainly think of news content and also film inserts, which would have been used for even studio programs, 
as short as VTs that we have nowadays or, or, or you know, packages that we would have. So we, we found that works pretty well that way. On the long form content, which is longer duration of, of, of uh, archive on film, we're still deciding uh, for 16 mil, do is 2K enough? Should we go 4K? And also I'd invite some thoughts on overscan, which was one of the, I'd be, I'd be curious to see the poll results um, because there is a school of thought that there is value in capturing uh, more than the active picture of the of each frame, uh, but to capture perforation as brackets go, and there's often something written there that might be useful for long term preservation. So, um, so we're still deciding on these things, and the uh, jury's out, but we will we will have decision relatively soon. So, that's all from me for now. So, to make up some time, Laurent. Are there any discussion about the first part of the debate? Uh, the debate uh, started with, uh, so Miroslav, you talked about uh, the splices, and then you talked about uh, the short film, the long film. Uh, the, those short uh, reels, uh, my question is the first one. Um, what about assembling the reels for having longer reels? Maybe is is there any advantage in, in the next steps of digitization in in having let's say jumbo reels as the result of a concatenation of shorter reels? I think so. Uh, if you make uh, bigger reels and a good workflow uh, in your digitizing process, then you can uh, digitize a lot of uh, your collection. So, uh, and maybe you can uh, make reels with uh, sound uh, and uh, different reels so without sound uh, of parts you, you only have the image of. So that's, uh, that can be very efficient. That's how we did it uh, at VRT too. Uh, there's uh, still another aspect. Uh, for example, if you have the film in a very, very small wheel, even without uh, a bobby inside, uh, the, the film itself is heavily bent. And if you put it directly in a scanner, you won't have it completely flat during scanning. There would, would have been uh, serious pro problems here. So big, big Getting it on a big reel and let it rest there for a couple of days definitely helps a lot here, uh, avoiding that problem, for example. There is maybe another aspect. Uh, it's about uh, the quality of scanning. Uh, if you have uh, jumbo reels, which are consisted of multiple film stocks, then there might be an issue that you cannot adopt the scanning device as good as possible, as if you would have one film stock. So if we're doing jumbo reels, it's a good advice to combine films which has the same film stock and same characteristics. Yeah. All, the, all the speakers on this uh, first part, uh, I don't know. Maybe a short comment on the splices. Uh, I think we all in our collection have some some real troublemakers, or let's say the the the, the horror reel. Uh, for example, uh, at ORF we had one year in the mid seventies uh, when they decided that uh, uh, let's say scotch tape from the supermarket is much uh, uh, less expensive than those uh, splice tapes we have to buy. So they used uh, 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 those simple scotch tapes in instead of proper uh, adhesive uh, film tape. And uh, well, we struggled a lot because uh, those didn't uh, only dry out, uh, but turned over to a slimy something. You nearly couldn't get off uh, the film itself. It was terrible. Yes, we have the same thing, and we don't have uh, defined periods of uh, cement splices and then tape splices, like uh, uh, Miroslav said. Uh, it's uh, used uh, all uh, mixed uh, from the beginning of television and film till the end, and uh, at VRT. Um, but uh, from time to time, uh, 
we even found uh, staples in our film collection. Uh, but uh, that was not for broadcast reasons, of course. Uh, it was um, uh, because sometimes a program crime maker uh, needed uh, a part of, uh, of, 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 uh, of the film to reuse in another program. And then uh, to, to, to view the, the film on the table, he sticked, uh, he, uh, we know who it was, <laughs> uh, some parts together. And uh, now um, yeah, uh, we have found uh, some uh, in our collection, of course, <laughs> but uh, not very often. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the cement splices, uh, they are the best, of course. Um, and uh, all, uh, the, the, the slimy and the, the, the sticky ones, uh, we don't like to see them. <laughs> okay, next is... Um, next is, uh, is better uh, quality, the, the, the topic uh, which was already mentioned before. Just briefly. Thank you, Laurent, uh, for handing over. Yeah, so we from China M Research, we are involved in, in several large-scale film digitization projects, and we are supporting the archives, the broadcasters, but also film archives in finding uh, appropriate quality control solutions for digitization, film digitization. And today, I would like to briefly talk briefly about three three of these projects. So Bayerische Rundfunk, Israeli Public Broadcast Corporation, Indian, Indian University, all of them are doing between five and 10,000 hours or have already done. And we have uh, also got experiences back from them. What were the issues there in this process of digitization? So what audiovisual issues are there? How to detect them, how to avoid them? And I would like to give also some information about what experiences they made, lessons made, lessons learned. So maybe next slide, please. Yeah, so when looking at what are the most frequent and partially also most crucial film digitization issues, audiovisual issues, I'm talking just about audiovisual issues. There are also file format issues and so on, but not talking about this one today. Uh, it can be categorized in four groups. The first one would be about light. Film is about light. Uh, typical issues are under or overexposure, black and white level is wrong or contrast got wrong. Uh, all, kind, all issues with light are more crucial uh, when a production format is used with very low densitometric resolution. So what we saw before in the question, when you have eight or 10 bits, uh, then adjusting the light is very, very crucial on the scanner. Uh, and should not be done, I think. And then it's also more crucial uh, when you are scanning with one light scan, what is typical out of uh, economic reasons. And it's also crucial, crucial as I mentioned before, when you're using merged or jumbo, jumbo reels. Yeah. So be careful about this. The second group of issues is about film transportation. So film is a physical media. Uh, and the physical condition matters of the media and that the adjustment of this detention on the film matters during scanning. So what can happen, you can have unsteadiness, you can have framing errors, uh, bad cropping, you can have visible splices and you can have splice bumps. So these are the typical things coming out of transportation. Then there can be equipment issues during scanning. So typically a film clean is involved. So that can break, a wet gate can produce unwanted image components like bubbles. Uh, the image processing pipeline can produce black or crooked frames or frozen frames. The sound processing pipeline can produce silence with a digital error and wrong audio levels. And finally, when you mastering the, the film, there you have to take care about synchronicity of audio and video and also color correction can go wrong if you have it part of your process. In the presentation or in the presentation you see here on the one, you can get a statistics from the Indiana University project about type and quantity of human verified digitization issues they had in their 10,000 hours project. Uh, so that's a good, a good, good resource of, to get an idea of what can happen to which quantity. 
um, maybe as a question to the round here, to the panelists, uh, do you encounter maybe also additional other digitization issues in your uh, film digitization projects? Well, uh, I would say, uh, for example, especially a shrinking can be a problem, uh, especially, for example, if the shrinking rate is uh, differently, for example, on picture and the sound film, and you have to, to, to keep those uh, in sync and, and like that. So there, there are some, some special uh, things that, that always uh, uh, came apparent uh, through our digitization as well. But uh, uh, lucky us, we did it ourselves we handed it over to the service provider and he had to deal with it we just heard then uh, the terrible mm. stories about all those things mm. yeah we we um, also uh, give our <laughs> vinegar film uh, to uh, <laughs> an external partner uh, but um, uh, we prepare the film. Uh, uh, we check if there is there if there is enough leader start and uh, ending. But um, what what yeah, we check also the splices. But um, we will not uh, uh, renovate them. So um, that's something for the for the uh, for the partner to do uh, if necessary. And uh, if if there is a problem with the sound, um, um, then we we get the file back, of course, and then we have to do uh, a lot of uh, post production, uh, and that's um, more uh, if um, a film can have sound, but not from the start till the end. Uh, mm. Mostly, it's yeah. uh, only the, the interview uh, part, um, and then. Yeah, also, if, if there is vinegar, you also always have the big um, asynchronization problem. Uh, so uh, vinegar, it's always uh, a lot of uh, post-production mm -hmm. work. That's uh, the main conclusion, I think. So also mastering issues are there. Yeah, yeah I yeah, see. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah um, Laurent, you could maybe go to the next slide. Sure. If it works, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So. There can things happen. We just have seen this in the last slide, uh, but there are also ways of finding issues and also avoiding issues. Uh, so there are mainly three approaches, quality control approaches for film digitization. Uh, you can fully check the film from begin to the end, whether there are issues or not. So manual checking, what is of course very costly and extremely exhausting. Uh, the another approach is spot checking. Just look to one, two, three spots in the film and play it for a few seconds and make your decision. It's cheap, but of course you're missing the issues which are in between the spots. And then there is a semi-automated approach where a, a computer uh, software runs over uh, in an automated way uh, over the, uh, the digitized files and analyzing it and uh, just presenting uh, suspicious sections uh, to QC operators, which can do then a quick decision. So this uh, combines full temporal coverage with cost efficiency of the process. Uh, in general, I would like to motivate also to think in the planning phase of a film digitization project, also about quality control. Um, and for example, about which quality level are you expecting? And what is acceptable? So it is different if you're a, or using a preservation master for a long-term digital preservation, or if you just want to have an access copy. So the, 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 yeah, the level of quality is very, very different. Uh, you should have an idea of which QC approach you would like to go with. Um, in general, it's also important to state that the QC cost today is already much lower than the film preservation or preparation or scanning cost. Uh, for example, in the Bayerische Rundfunk project, they had nine people in film preparation and 1.5 people in the quality control. Only preparation versus quality control and scanning is almost the same as preparation. Yeah, uh, yeah then also QC, I think is really a topic for the archive or for the content owner. So the, the archive wants to preserve, the archive wants to reuse, and it's, it's less a topic 
for the scanning unit as they have no natural motivation to do quality control that they do have to do work again afterwards. So that's not in their natural intention, <laughs> I think. And maybe I'll do my next slide. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, then coming to some operational experiences and lessons learned in these three projects. Uh, so the, the workflow is, uh, as you see here on the top, to have uh, from analog to digital archive in between at least a uh, there are many steps more, but what I'm focusing today is uh, about film scanning and mastering as one step and quality control as the second step. Um, so one conclusion out of the Indiana project was that the rejection rate, so when quality control says no, it's not acceptable and it goes back to the service provider or to the in-house digitization unit. So this is rejected. The rejection rate can be quite high. So it was a surprise. In many months, it was between three and 25%. And it was also even above for some months for a lot of specific reasons. So to plan for a proper rejection workflow, to plan for a proper information exchange between the parties is, is important. Then what is also can be seen from the, uh, from the Indiana project is if you're doing QC uh, and if you are rejecting and then do a rescan or remastering of the issues, you can reduce the number of issues in average by a factor of six in this project. So it makes sense to do QC and to remaster and rescan. Re uh, in the Bayer Rundfunk project, we could see that consequent quality control can also reduce the number of audiovisual, over audiovisual issues over time. So in the first year, they had 16% uh, sorry, the rejection rate was 16%. And with consequent quality control, they came down in the third year to 5%. Uh, it's still high, but it's going down. So that's the important thing. And that's good as uh, that is good for the archive. And that's good for the one who is doing the digitization as, a, as it's, not, it's avoiding cost and effort. Then another point is to really do see as early as possible after scanning to avoid the accumulation of systematic issues. Like in one project, was a film cleaner broken. Uh, of course, the earlier you detect that, the less work you have to redo. Um, yeah, and in all these projects, we could see that it's good to have a special attention at specific points in time in such projects. Uh, for example, when you're doing one stock first, another stock then, Whenever you're changing the film stock, uh, you should pay more attention to see also when harder software changes in the workflow, like scanner software or mastering software or whatever software or hardware, and also when personal changes, of course. Uh, since um, quite many issues are coming from how, for example, scanning operators are adjusting things on the, on the scanner. Uh, and this can also change, of course, with the personal. Yeah, so that was from my side, the main operational experiences and lessons learned from these projects. Maybe are there in the panelists round also other experiences made, operational experiences from your digitization projects you could share? Peter, I, I think we, can, uh, we co could go a little bit deeper about something that helps talk also Miroslav and is about the criteria of um, selecting the quality of the scan. I think we haven't talked a lot about that and I think it will be like a good thing to go deeper a little bit. Okay, but uh, maybe not in the format today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's too long. <laughs> well, we can, yeah. can come back on this. Uh... Uh, yes. Yeah, sure. Criteria, general topic, I think. Yeah. So criteria yeah. for scanners, criteria for mastering, uh, criteria for acceptance mm -hmm. in the quality control. Uh, most things I mentioned before are measurable. Yeah. Uh, but it's also sometimes a bit tricky to express them also well. Yeah. Oh, one question. Uh, if we don't have time now, we can use the question slot. Uh, you talk about rejection. Uh, can you say more about uh, which are the main reasons for the rejection? 
that this could be a link to is the if the reason is the scanner or the configuration of the scanner no uh, as, as you have seen in this slide with the av issues yeah? okay. so there were these four categories and and these subcategories out of all these things things have been rejected in this project yeah so and there are, I think, 15, 20 more kind of other issues like shrinkage, uh, scanning problems during shrinkage and many other issues, but uh, it was not possible to bring that to one slide. <laughs> sure. Okay, so. Uh, but these are the most frequent, the most crucial things we, or also actually the archives. So the Bayerische Rundfunk in the University and, and Israeli public broadcaster encountered in their workflows, yeah. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, we'll uh, go ahead because we are a bit late. We want to know about uh, about the experience of uh, Señal Memoria in Colombia, <laughs> Carol. Hi, Laurent. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about the experience of Señal Memoria. Uh, and go a little bit deeper about the outsource film digitization, the processes that we do, uh, the process type, the outsource format, and the digitization issues. So you can go next, please, Laurent. So, um, Señal Memoria uh, is the area in charge of the safeguarding, preservation, and conservation of the audiovisual and sound heritage of RTVC that is the Colombian public media system. Uh, in our archive, we preserve um, approximately 450,000 documents, more or less 2,000 hours of film material from 1940s until 1980s, and 9,000 careers of different durations. Regarding the source of the formats, we have 16 millimeters and 35 millimeters. Uh, all of them are acetate, black and white color, we have like the same proportion uh, and there are different uh, positive, negative prints, inter-negative and inter-positives. Uh, next slide, please, Laurent. Yes. Uh, regarding the digitization processes, we more or less have done the 45% of our film documents and we have them in a digital archive. Talking about the scanner, we do it in Norlight and we have done only the 10% of it using this process. Regarding uh, the 40% have done in Telesign, in Telesign Best Light, and we have done it in-house. Um, regarding our choice to do the scanning, the scanning outsource, depend on uh, mostly of technical aspects and also financial aspects. Uh, inside Colombia, we don't have a really good scan, so we have to rent the service outsource. Normally, we do it in Mexico and USA. Uh, um, talking about all the process, uh, we do this, the preparation of the film, the cleaning, check and renew of the splices inside of our institution, and then we send the materials to do the outsource processes. Uh, when we talk about the scanning, the scanning process, we regulate it. So we determine the technical characteristic of the digital, the digitization of the image and sound, and also the output formats. Uh, and during all the process, we do the quality control. Uh, as Peter was talking about, it's like a really important uh, thing to, to keep in mind. Uh, after doing all the process of digitization, we received the DPX files and we conform the film to carry out all the digital processes. Uh, we do inside our institution the restoration and the mastering of the of the of the films. Talking about the outsource uh, film formats, we normally do uncompressed videos using we have inside institution DPX 2K. 248 per by 1080, and we also have DP, DCP, and DCDM and ProRes. Uh, always we do the mastering in HQ, 4K ProRes 444, LQ 9020 and 1080. And we also have to do the mastering for television broadcast. So we normally do it in MXF container and we also have an online broadcast, so we have to do mastering in MP4 codec, H264 or H265. 
Uh, regarding the long-term preservation, we normally do the copy of the material in LTO6 and LTO8 tapes. Um, regarding like the last issue is about the digitization issue. So normally uh, we have we have have some problems regarding the physical state of the original negative to positive. Uh, like we have figured that for um, not having to avoid future issues during the digitization, uh, we have to do like all the the before process of preparing all the material inside the institution and then send it. And other of the issues that we have uh, up front during the digitization is the lack of original sound in the film careers. So we normally, like in, the, in, in some of the cases, we do the reconstruction of the soundtrack using other magnetic copies. So it's my work. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Is this uh, was it the inspiration for for some comments uh, by the other speakers uh, or comparison of other approaches? I'm just curious, do you also outsource film preparation as well as scanning, or or do you keep the um, preparation in house? We do the we do all the preparation in house. Then we send the material to do it outsourcing. Digitization. Yeah. And you get uh, uh, as as the uh, digitization is uh, even in another country, uh, which is the delivery modality. Do they send uh, to you LTO tapes? Yes, normally we do it that way. By the way, you are in very good shape. Forty-five percent only. Only that part was done uh, with telecine. Uh, devices and not uh, if I understood well. Yes. And also it's because we don't have like this big, big collection of film. Our collection, like the big one is in magnetic and digital. So it's, it's, it's like a faster process for us. Okay. I'm checking just the time because we are a bit later. Uh, so we come back uh, to Kathleen. And that, however, we can come back on any any topic. Okay, Kathleen, welcome <laughs> from VRT. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> thank you, Laura, and uh, greetings from Brussels. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm going to tell something about the collection, the film collection of uh, VRT. Um, we have uh, a little bit 10% uh, of 35 millimeter and the rest is uh, 16 millimeter in our collection. Uh, we have uh, since one year uh, our, uh, fully mapped uh, uh, all the film and uh, it's uh, accessible and searchable, but um, only 20% of our uh, collection is, uh, has a copy and it's a SD uh, copy. So it's on the next slide. Um, so we work on demand, um, always on demand. But in 2008, we had a, a big uh, project in our archive. Uh, uh, there were different reasons. Uh, in 2007, the news department uh, re started recording a fully digital and they wanted uh, the archive to be accessible and so digital too. Um, there were also some celebrations. In 2008, there was 50 years of uh, the World Exposition in Brussels. That was in 58. Um, and uh, in 2010, there would be the 50 years uh, independence of Congo. So we needed uh, large parts of our film collection so uh, the project, uh, there we copied uh, also tape and radio and uh, not only um, film, so uh, different kinds of um, uh, carriers from radio and television. But um, the film, um, yeah, we, uh, we did all the news items uh, and we copied it with our telecine on 
and the production format was um, DV25 because the news department worked also in this format. And next to the, um, the news items on film, we uh, digitized also uh, a, a large amount of um, uh, programs with a cultural and um, uh, historical value. So general programs and they had uh, uh, the production format as it's a D10. And um, yeah, so um, this was all done with our telecine and we used it for years and years and years. Um, but uh, the copy was made on tape and we had to insert the tape in our mom. We couldn't get uh, an export file uh, out of uh, this old uh, shadow. And um, so, yeah, it was end of life and we had to look for a solution. So uh, we still have expertise in house. Uh, so we wanted to invest in, in a film scanner and uh, continue this, the, the digitizing of our film collection, of course. Uh, so on the next slide, um, you can see uh, our um, film scanner. It's the MVL Spinner S. And we use uh, the Diamond uh, Dustbuster Plus as um, the correction software. So yes, if you click, it will start. <laughs> um, for the Setmach, we use an old but very good device, uh, the MVR, uh, which is connected uh, to the, the scanner. Um, we only... Uh, do some uh, semi-automated uh, dust removal and a bit of stabilization, of course. And uh, the output is uh, DPX, which is transferred to a FFV1 video file. Um, and uh, this file is stored uh, at MIMO. It's our partner. It's the Flemish uh, Institute for the Archives. Um, and we uh, at VRT, we store the production format. Um, it's an AVC 100. Uh, and that's um, very good because uh, that way it can easily be used uh, for uh, the pro program makers, of course. So um, if someone needs uh, the original file to do uh, color correction or it's uh, needed for a big uh, film project or whatever, um, uh, it, uh, people can, can ask for this um, preservation copy. Uh, it's uh, stored at MIMO, so uh, it's uh, available. But we only work since one month with this uh, new scanner. And uh, at this moment, uh, we are... Um, doing a project uh, together with an external partner uh, on a series about agriculture. Um, and we hope to do to digitize uh, uh, approximately 100 films um, this year. And uh, next to that, so we, we, we continue starting um, digitizing on demand, of course. Uh, but uh, now we have our collection uh, fully mapped. Uh, we also have to uh, check uh, how we are going to set our digitizing priorities uh, in the future and to build also an uh, efficient uh, digitizing flow, renovating and digitizing flow, of course. And we hope to do it uh, uh, in-house, of course, too. So this is um, our status at this moment. At VRT. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before uh, leaving the leaving Christoph to, to end the debate, uh, uh, any any comments uh, on this? Uh, well, I have one uh, 100, 100 films uh, this year is the plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems that uh, uh, it will be a slow digitization process to complete. Uh, it means that uh, your films are in very, in very good preservation condition. Mm, most are in a very good condition. However, uh, this week we had one film with all dried splices. So uh, 
um, uh, the selection has, has to be made and then it's uh, important to look uh, what is the state of uh, the film and then uh, yeah, build an efficient flow. So um, we are uh, checking all the conditions at this moment and then we hope to, um, to digitize every day of the week, of course, but we only have a few people to do it as... Um, so the reason of the of the the slow process is the the size of the team. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the project in two thousand and eight, we were uh, with uh, five uh, people. Uh, we worked uh, seven days a week um, for digitizing, and the renovation was five days a week. So it was always up and running. Uh, but now we have uh, only. Uh, two, three people who can work on this uh, renovation and uh, digitizing process. So it goes slower, yeah. So Christopher, I, I see that you're ready. So a TV yeah. archive or a film archive? And this is the question. Yes, this is the question. Is a, a television archive still a proper film archive. Uh, this was the question uh, that has been raised at ORF already a couple of years ago when we reached a certain percentage of digitization. Although, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we uh, also uh, uh, started from today's point of view too early. So, uh, uh, next slide, please, Laura. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think our fir first uh, uh, film digitization that uh, was, uh, uh, let's say, seen as a project was around 2005, 2006. And of course, it was not on file, but on the 10 tapes. And we got stuck to SD from that moment on. Uh, um, so, uh, the big advantage is that it was rather quick because we had the money for it. And this was one of our decisions in 2011 when we switched over to file. There was a decision whether we should uh, switch over uh, film digitiz uh, digitization to HD as well. But uh, we decided to stay in, on SD because with, with the money available for the next decade, we've been able to uh, digitize more than 90, up to 100% of our collection. Doing in HD, we would have been stuck at approximately 25%. And so we wanted to have at least an, a proper uh, access copy here. As soon uh, as we started digitizing, of course, a uh, question has been raised within our company. The first one, of course, uh, do, you need, uh, do you still need the films? Because we would need the space where it is stored right now. Uh, so please get rid of it. Um, uh, another problem was uh, that over the time, uh, the experts retired and all the expertise left the company. So there are at ORF, I would say, in the archive we are two 50 percent film uh, guys which i'm one of those 50 percent film uh, uh, experts and uh, in our technical department for example there's no one left uh, so we had uh, pretty soon to decide to outsource it as much as possible and if we outsource uh, the whole digitization process why not outsourcing storage as well so uh, uh, the permanent cut of resources and, and uh, that uh, speeded up uh, um, our thinking in that direction. So next slide, please. And of course, uh, uh, the few ones left who uh, cared for film uh, uh, wanted to avoid to have an improper storage or uh, an already happening improper handling of uh, our uh, valuable collection. So we, uh, we already had um, a cooperation contract with the Austrian Film Archive and we renegotiated it, adding the storage plus uh, the digitization of our um, uh, collection in uh, this cooperation contract, which means now that the storage uh, is uh, 
step by step, uh, hand it over to uh, the Austrian Film Archive. For them, this is a quite valuable as well, because now they have a, a perfect argument uh, to ask for a state money for a, a new big uh, storage building. Uh, of course, digitization uh, uh, will uh, be much better in the future now because uh, the Austin Film Archive, if they now have our film stock, whenever we need uh, something in a better quality than SD, uh, they can do up to 4K without a problem and they are the experts uh, uh, here. So uh, uh, this is a, a big advantage for us as well. Plus, uh, and this is, let's say the win situation, uh, the second win situation for the film archive is they uh, will, uh, will be able uh, to easily use our collection for their academic research, plus also for their use in uh, their uh, daily uh, research and other um, uh, things. So uh, uh, next and last slide, please. Uh, for, for ORF, I would say, no, we are no longer a film archive. We're trying to get rid of the film within the next year. So when I uh, retire, I do hope that film will retire at ORF as well. So uh, handing over uh, the television film collection to a national film institute, I recommend for all of those who are not able to keep expertise within their company. And here ends my uh, part of the speech. Wow, thank you, Christoph. Uh, what is the time? In on time for, for starting the question and answer, so we can collapse the, the debate on your part and the question and answer session. Uh, but one question by me. Uh, are you is your case, Christoph, a lucky case? Uh, or do you think that uh, this can be done in, in other by other organizations as well? Uh, I wouldn't say that this is a lucky case. It's uh, just about, uh, uh, of course, uh, we didn't start to negotiate with the film archive uh, at this very moment. We already had a deca uh, a decades long cooperation with them. So, of course, it's important to start from uh, already an existing cooperational ground. This helps a lot. Of course, also, uh, uh, since in Austria, uh, there are two different film institutes, the Film Archive, who takes care of, let's say, the Austriaca in uh, films, and the Film Museum, uh, who is taking care of all the, let's say, uh, film as an art uh, uh, point of view. It's easy to uh, uh, get the right partner here who definitely needs, also needs our collection to uh, keep his level of importance in Austria. So uh, uh, since our collection is nearly as big as the current collection of the film archive, it means for them to double up their collection, which is very important for them. This, uh, therefore, they've been very interested uh, doing the deal with us. On the other side, since they've been eager to do the deal with us, for us, it's now uh, we get pretty good prices for digitization in 2K and 4K without uh, uh, setting up new digitization contracts with other uh, service providers here. Yes, it was a lucky punch, uh, but uh, uh, I, didn't, I don't know uh, how it would have been ended if we did, had another decision or if we didn't have the pressure, pressure in-house for uh, getting the vaults uh, free of film. I see. Because we, we, we know that uh, for many organizations, the cost of uh, storing properly the films mm -hmm. is, is really high. Yeah. And um, it, is a part, it is a part of the problem. So uh, it depends on the conditions, sure. But uh, the, I know that there is a, someone thinking that uh, films in bad condition, very bad condition, after the decision should be probably, should be disposed. That there is no other chance to improve uh, mm -hmm. uh, any better. Uh, is, uh, what, what do you think, uh, or you and all the other speakers? Well, uh, since this was a debate as well, 
I'm quite happy to say that the, the, the quality of our film collection is still quite high. We only had around five vinegar problem uh, uh, set max. All the rest is still uh, uh, over 4.7 uh, on, on the scale we've seen in Jörg's uh, uh, speech. So uh, here we are still in a pretty good uh, quality and therefore also the film archive, archive doesn't have any problem taking over our collection. If this would be, uh, let's say, a, a vinegar farm, uh, they would be much more hesitant to do so. Um, so definitely, yes, if, if you've been able to have a proper scanning and here's the, the, the this, uh, question may start, proper scanning in, uh, in what relation to? Uh, to a television relation, to a film relation? Um, it's not that easy. It's much more easy uh, to get rid, for example, of one inch B tapes from ACFA. After we digitized them to SD, we got rid of them, all of them. And we didn't uh, lost any second thought on them. On film, it's definitely a different story here. Any remarks on this question? In the meantime, I ask uh, Etienne to help me to have a look uh, at the question and answer the questions. There was actually a question related to what we just talked about. Um, because in one of the questionnaires, we have a question uh, about the f f file, the tricky one you said, and uh, one of the the proposition was, is your file format a full replacement of the film? So some people uh, seem to wonder if by that we mean that once it's digitized, we can just dispose of, of the films. So indeed, that, that's not what we meant. That's not that simple. But um, the, the question can be asked, especially in the case where the film uh, is reaching a very bad condition. Will there be any improvement that can be made? Uh, so that's uh, that's still a debate. I think there's no uh, unique answer for for that question. Uh, so, uh, many questions has been answered uh, in writing, at least in part. Uh, I see. I saw also there was a hand ri raised, but I would encourage uh, that was from uh, Lorena uh, Baldigoni. Uh, I would encourage uh, Lorena to write the question in the in the in the Q and A box. It will be easier to deal with it. And um, what else do we have? Um, The fact uh, there is a question on well, um, I see a question about uh, the storage of film together with the storage of videotape uh, in TV archives. Uh, this is not a very good idea, but uh, it happens. Um, the story the same. Can you please comment on that? Uh, what are the risks and what and are there low cost solutions? Low, there are never low cost solutions, probably. And uh, the comment is that uh, this is wrong. It is understandable because uh, the TV archive uh, got uh, bigger with the tapes and not with the film, but uh, no, it is not a good idea. Really. Uh, however, there, uh, this, the current situation comes from the past. You cannot uh, decide what has been done uh, uh, years and years ago. So the question could be, well, from my perspective, uh, e uh, the question could be, is it better to improve the storage condition of the film uh, uh, radically or better to go straightforward to a quick uh, a massive digitization process. This is for all of you. Miroslav, <laughs> the first one, please. <laughs> well, I guess um, we, have been, we have been focusing on collections, individual collections, and uh, be it news, be it um, ad hoc transfers on specific dates. So. Just a massive, uh, massive part. I 
you know, with the resources that we have, um, especially the prepping being the bottleneck. That's why I was so interested in Carol's view, uh, you know, when, when you're outsourcing, how do you still do the prep? Do you do it in-house? Do you do it, um, do you outsource that as well? Which is, I'm sure, possible to be outsourced. But but yeah, our, our uh, approach to how do you eat an elephant is in um, small bites. <laughs> <laughs> We will try this. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, I answered to the question, are you planning to share the presentation? Yes. The presentation will be available on the Fiat Tifta website. Also, also the recording, well, maybe later on, but yes, also the recording. Um, any other? What, 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 Richard, we, we yeah. miss you. Um, could I just say with regard to, do you put your money into digitization or do you put your money into good storage? Um, and I'm sorry, my answer is it depends. Uh, if you have very good digitization and you know somewhere that like Christoph, where you can then put the digitized film so that it still has good storage, then, then that would be the best thing to do. You put your money into digitization and somebody else has to put their money into storage. If you're not in that fortunate position, then you really are trying to juggle two things at once. And it will literally depend on how good your digitization and quality control is. Uh, and if you can't get really good digitization and quality control now, then you are, I think, forced to put at least a, a good chunk of your budget into adequate storage so that you can kick the can down the road until you can do good digitization, which is the ultimate answer in my view. Thank you. Thank you to you. I'm looking to other comments on this. Uh, if not, uh, I see a number of questions about uh, uh, quality. Um, in the case uh, that uh, film is also keeping a bad content. Um, how is is easy or not? Uh, what are the modalities to, to be able to have a distinction between the defects that were on the film and they will always be on, on the digital uh, copy and the, the defects that come, come from, from a, a wrong uh, digitization. This is, uh, if I understood well, one or two questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, may I give a, give it a try? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think for the issues I mentioned, I mentioned on my slide about AV issues. So all of them are issues which can cause troubles during the digitization and can be introduced during the digitization. So can be from the carrier, can be from the adjustment of the scanner of the light. Um, additional to this, there are many, many more issues uh, which are inside the film, inside captured. Uh, you could look for, for film grain, uh, you could look for, for copying artifacts of different, different types. Um, but I think they can be discriminated. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, but of course, you need specific, specific, specific technology, be it hardware, be it software. But you need specific technology to discriminate these two classes. Yeah. Uh, it's, a human can do that also, of course. But that's the time and effort intensive way of doing this. So there are better ways of automation and also supporting humans for making that check quicker. Yeah. There are two new questions. Uh, maybe maybe yeah. one additional point I just want to add. Yes. Uh, it is practically not possible to get rid of all the issues of digitization. So it's to get it down to a certain percentage. 
uh, and we saw this in the Indiana project this is quite good, an improvement of less issues, or it is good, uh, but something remains dependent on the effort you put into it. Yeah? And it is wise if you have a QC process in your digitization and quality control and are having workflow to keep the information you gathered during the digitization and during quality control to keep this best in case of metadata which are machine readable uh, to keep this information as part of your archival package so that you later can um, can you start from that point also with digital restoration since many many issues which are still there can be digitally restored with a certain effort and for example splices is an example this can be done you can restore splices um, typically not fully automatically today so it is an effort so you have to decide whether you're doing it today in a suboptimal quality or you're doing it maybe in future on request for the content so keeping that metadata for the future as an archival package part uh, i think is useful yeah. Thank you, uh, Ari Mark. Mm -hmm. Another sub question on this, uh, and and what about uh, um, mistakes or um, made in the preparation part of the work? So something, so I don't know, not enough cleaning, or not uh, too much dust, uh, things like that. Or what what improvement uh, is crucial in the preparation part before scanning? We talked about splices already. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, I think all the things which cannot be done later on, uh, and that's also in the scanning process. Uh, so if you have really a highest amount of line stretches, uh, then practically you should go with wet gate. Yeah, so you get much more quality out of it if you would do it in a digital domain, uh, since you can solve it physically in this case, uh, uh, with a wet gate, and this should be done. Uh, of course, there are also some troubles with wet gates, but they can be handled. Yeah. Mm. But that's just wet gate. Maybe there are other comments, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course, we are here. Otherwise, we ask uh, to Etienne, which are the two new questions? <laughs> Michael? It has changed since, but there's one uh, directed towards uh, Richard, Kathleen and Charles, uh, who shared pictures of uh, shelves and film cans. And the question is, how confident are you that you know what's in those film cans? Yeah. I mean, do you really, uh, how good is your inventory? Are you sure of, uh, or do you have surprises sometimes that uh, things are not what you thought they would be? Um... So uh, we have, uh, like I said, fully mapped our film collection and we have, uh, so all the films were, uh, the, the image and the sound were in one can uh, and we separated them in different uh, cans. So uh, that's better for the vinegar, of course, um, uh, to have no infection on the image. And um, on that way, we, we we have um, touched every film, like a, uh, and we have moved it in, in, in a new uh, can. So uh, sometimes we we've put it under the film table and checked things, but we are not always uh, hundred percent sure if uh, the sound is um, uh, the sound that uh, belongs to the image. Sometimes we have um, we detect. Uh, another sound uh, so it's it was um, in the past uh, not um, put in the right can and the 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 length is, is, is maybe the same and, and and could belong to the image but um, that could be a lesson learned maybe to um, uh, if you do this job and you you put all the film in, in new cans that you would do a check and 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 um, be sure that it's the right sound. But even then, if you do that, um, I think uh, there can still be a chance that there is um, some uh, fault. Uh, you don't always, you are not always uh, hundred percent sure if it's the correct sound on the 
uh, video because if it's only music or uh, ambiance, uh, so yeah, it could be from belong to another image. That's something. But um, the titles that were on the cans, uh, they are all put in the, the database uh, together with um, all the technical information of the film. So uh, that's something that we know now. So uh, if you go in our basement and uh, walk through the cellar, uh, all the films here that you see behind me, uh, yeah, we know what is inside. Exact. Richard. Um, I wanted to say that I think there's some good news for broadcasting archives in general. Uh, because of the broadcast production process, the documentation tends to be, um, in my experience, quite high compared to, for instance, um, a state memory institution that gets donations from all and sundry and, and they might come in tea chests full of um, all kinds of reels of this, that and the other. Um, so the problem hand, the problem in, in, in broadcasting archives arises when a whole broadcaster gives up its collection or goes out of business or something and, and then a, a truck full of tapes and films and whatever arrives at some poor institution that has to deal with it. But within the broadcasters themselves, we're usually in, in pretty good shape. Um, they used to say an army travels on its stomach. And then at one point I found myself writing that an archive travels on its catalog. And, and, and those institutions that have employed archivists and librarians and have built up their metadata don't really have the, we don't know what this is problem. Thank you, thank you very much. Looking at the clock, uh, it would be the time uh, for, for uh, listening. Charles, what uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, now it's you between you. <laughs> it falls to me to condense the the, yes, the, uh, the the memories and and expectations of ten people just from one mouth, which is very difficult. But thank you very much for inviting me uh, to do that or to try and do that. I've worked on both sides of um, television archives in the sense of videotape um, digitization and film digitization. So I've seen a lot of the challenges that we have been talking about today. And um, do I feel uh, comfortable that television archives uh, have a, a good direction on uh, their film, uh, the future of their films? Yes, I certainly do. Um, I was very heartened to, um, to hear so much of the language of film being, um, being used um, by, by TV. Um, uh, people, TV archivists. There is a language that goes with film. There's a, a, a huge uh, memory of, of the technicalities and the uh, processes that still exists, which is extremely um, heartening because without that understanding of what is frankly a complex three-dimensional object, um, uh, it's very hard to make the decisions that are required. So one point that I take away from this, um, this webinar is that uh, it's vitally important that all the voices that can be heard are heard. And, uh, you know, to me, the people with the, with the living knowledge and the experience of the, of the, the objects that are film and the processes that, that, that created them, um, those are stakeholders, uh, you know, in, in the true sense of the word and decisions, big ethical archival eth ethical decisions, which, which ultimately connect with, um, you know, the collection um, ethics as well of what do we keep and what do we not keep um, will largely have to be steered by knowledge of those collections um, and, uh, and decisions made um, using the best available intelligence. So, um, yeah, so um, videotape, uh, just to reflect back onto that, to compare the two processes, videotape is, is hellishly complex as we know. It requires, you know, huge uh, engineering um, capabilities to be able to make machinery that works to play back videotapes. Um, film, relatively speaking, is an object that you can um, take your time over looking at. You can scan it one frame at a time uh, and you can indeed even hold the film up in front of you and uh, enjoy looking at it with your eyes as individual images. 
Um, however, um, videotape um, has really one last chance because the mechanisms required to convey those tapes through the machines to produce the digitization in the first place and the skills and all the resources necessary to do that are in decline. So there is no real time to um, ponder one frame at a time with videotape. So I think that that to some extent steers the, or has a bearing on the debate about whether we keep um, film materials longer term than we do videotape. With videotape, the, the, the tape itself has no aesthetic value. Um, and also you have one chance to play it really because of the finite uh, nature of the resources. Whereas with film, you have um, something you can hold in your hand uh, and enjoy um, and interpret without too much technology. So, um, you know, technology is obviously the savior for uh, releasing the content from the films uh, so that it can be used and enjoyed and, and create commercial gain as well as um, cultural gain. Um, but for videotape, that's not the case. Um, so uh, the other thing that I was really, um, really interested in today was um, was was to observe the, the the polls and to see where everybody is and how far how far we have all got. And actually, I I felt that we had moved uh, collectively um, as a community of television archives uh, very impressively in in good directions. And indeed. Um, one of the bigger questions around digital preservation, once you've digitized your film, once you've, you know, you've prepared it and you've, you've remade all the splices that didn't work and uh, you've cleaned it and you've, uh, you know, you've got it to the state where you can scan it, is, um, you know, what do you do with the data once, once you've created that? And indeed, uh, open standards uh, are mentioned um, already. And that feels to me like it's more advanced for this stage of the of the proceeds as it was with videotape. It feels like there's more momentum um, with film digitization to, uh, to, to, to make sure that the data itself is more future-proof uh, and more open, which is really encouraging. Um, other points that I, that I pick up on now, obviously quality is a big issue. Um, and um, it really, again, depends on what the films were to begin with as to how to determine the quality of the digitization process. So, you know, feature films, um, of which I was surprised actually, are in a larger volume. Um, I think I read 58% of collections can, were, were, were movies. Now, these are, these are artistically creative um, works. So, you know, they, uh, they have... A, um, you know, they have had a lot of creative input. Um, they, they weren't just made in a hurry to put on for a news program uh, and then to be forgotten for forevermore. These, these are works that, that have had, you know, large investment um, and, and um, artistic uh, input. And that's an aspect of film um, preservation that is um, potentially of more interest to film institutions like the one I work for, the British Film Institute, than, than possibly a TV company. But um, from an ethical point of view, I think that it's um, important that we do justice to the materials. So if materials were created in a way that, uh, you know, encapsulated high quality, and of course that goes for sound as well as for picture, then there must be um, at least a proportionate endeavor made to, uh, to, to check off in the quality process that that's been achieved. Um, it's really uh, encouraging to know that the automation of QC, of quality control, um, will, be, um, will be driven by people who understand that uh, level of, 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 of nuanced detail with film, that actually no two pieces of film are the same. Um, and, you know, whether you're dealing with positives or negatives or reversal film or intermediates, they all have, and 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter, um, they all have different characteristics. So there's no one size fits all quality solution. It has to be, um, it has to be based on the understanding of, 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 of the materials themselves. Um, so I think that probably from my perspective um, are the, the key points that I take away from this. Um, my final point on my, on my little list there is that um, commercial um, service provision um, as well as technology uh, combined 
um, provide us with a very, very um, great level of hope. Um, I, I know from my own experience and from listening uh, today that um, there is a tremendous amount of effort coming from the commercial service sector to, uh, to bring solutions and uh, bring experience to help with these challenges that we face. And um, while it is really important and as archivists to maintain um, our own um, pers perspective on our collections, and the ethical view that archivists tend to take, it's also really important, I think, to draw upon the experiences of the commercial sector who um, have an understanding also of um, the business um, cases for uh, preservation and, and aid, at least we can use those, those business minds to help us as archivists to produce stronger business cases. So working closely with service providers and technologists, I think is uh, vitally important for the, um, for the furthering, further case that we have to make for investment, because investment of course always is um, at, the, at the base of any, of any major project. So to conclude, um, I think it's a positive um, picture. Um, there are people coming from all different directions, but it does seem that as a community, the television archive um, body is moving in the same general direction, which is to take a very um, practical, pragmatic, sensible view on something that is extremely important um, because the living memory that we have between us, uh, most of us, I'm just looking at the screens and you know, got to be careful not to, uh, not to make a thing of age, but um, it is heading in, in a, in a, in a, towards retirement and the legacy that we leave behind in the knowledge and information and intelligence um, that is gathered together through initiatives like this is going to be vitally important to future archivists and anyone who wants to enjoy the content that's held within the films uh, in the future. So that's my conclusion or my conclusions. It just falls to me now to thank, um, first of all, the panelists, um, the, uh, everybody who's contributed um, to uh, today's session and also uh, in particular to Laurent who has to uh, keep us all together and point us all in the right direction, which he does spectacularly well. Um, we would really like to hear um, any any um, uh, feedback on the um, on the session today. How 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 you felt it went, where where it was uh, strong, and where perhaps maybe we can improve it next time. Um, I know that the uh, the World Conference, the Fiat IFTA World Conference in October, will also be continuing this conversation. So we very much look forward to seeing as many people uh, either virtually or in person there so that we can uh, continue this conversation and hopefully um, have more, more to say once, once we've thought about it even more. So thank you very much. I think that draws us to the end of the seminar. I think we're about on time. Thank you very much to everybody who joined as attendees. Without you, then there's no point in doing this. Uh, I know that you've joined us from all over the world and that some of you are probably uh, halfway through where you should be asleep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to, to the audience, of course. And uh, uh, we are happy to keep in contact. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. The, the seminar. Bye, everyone.